Matthew chapter 3 this morning. So we're looking at uh, the life and ministry of Jesus and and uh, I, I can't believe we're on the third lesson already, but <laughs> we are. So we're going to begin here in, in Matthew chapter 3. We're, today we're going to be looking at uh, the baptism of Jesus and why this is significant, why this is important. So we're going to begin reading this morning in Matthew 3 and verse number 1. The Bible says here, In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had this raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went out from him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers! Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. I shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with or he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat unto the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So we're going to stop there for now, but as we look at this, in this passage, it begins with, with John the Baptist coming out of the wilderness, and he's baptizing and all who would believe, and he's preaching, and, and so this John the Baptist appears on the stage, appears on the scene. He's, he's a, kind of a crazy man, if you will, and the Bible here says that he's, he's dressed in in camel's hair and he eats locust and wild honey and he's just kind of an odd character. But as we look at this, we need to remember that, that John, of course, is the cousin of Jesus. He was born to Zacharias and Elizabeth uh, just six months prior to the birth of Jesus. And this is, it was John who leaped in the womb of Elizabeth when Mary came to visit when she was pregnant. And, and so he, he felt the presence of God and, and leaped in the belly and, and Elizabeth got all excited. And, and so this is the same John. And so uh, th this passage, he's, he, he's not only baptizing believers, but he's also preaching to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I mean, he sees them come and they, they've come out to see, is this guy a threat to us? And when he, when he notices them, he begins preaching to them and as he's preaching and baptizing, what we see here is essentially the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. Because Jesus is about to step on the scene, and this is where everything begins. So this is kind of the starting point of who he is, what he's there for, and, and so we see this taking place. And, and this event is actually so important that all four Gospels have an account of this same event. And they're, they're nearly word for word. They don't cover everything exact, but they're so close in comparison that you can't help but see that this is what really happened. So as we look at this, we look at the, the baptism of Jesus, what is it that we do see in this passage? And so first of all, I want you to notice we see here in these first few verses that we read the preparation for Jesus. Uh, back in verse 1 again, it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. So again, we're not going to read all these verses again. We're going to go through them. But as we think about this, so he's prophesied, John the Baptist has prophesied in Isaiah chapter 40. And so they're saying he's here. This is the prophet. This is the one that we spoke of. Now again, as we talked about Jesus and his birth being prophesied, all of the Jews who had been studying Scripture, they have been going to the synagogue since they were little children, they should have known who this was, right? Because they've studied the prophecies. They've studied the Word of God. They've been taught about this mysterious man who's going to appear. So he's prophesied in Isaiah, and when he shows up, his appearance is more like Elijah. This crazy wild man like Elijah was and, and living in the wilderness and, and eating this strange diet and he's just, he's a crazy man for all intents and purposes. But he said, it says here, you repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's his message. So what's he telling them? Things are about to change, folks. Now, he doesn't say this, but his appearance says this. Everything you've known is about to be different. Things are about to change. We're about to take a turn in lifestyle, in religion, in faith. Everything you've been taught is about to change. So moving on to uh, verse number 7, this brought the attention of the Pharisees. Verse 7 says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to, unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So, John sees the Pharisees and the Sadducees have arrived and he turns and he, he begins preaching this scathing message to them. I mean, he's not holding back. He calls them vipers. He, he says, hey, you guys are miserable. I mean, what are you even doing here? What are you teaching? Everything, again, everything that you have been taught is about to be torn down. The ax is about to be laid to the root of the tree. What's he telling them? Things are about to change. Your whole world's going to be turned upside down. You have no idea what's coming. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, the Pharisees have come out simply to see, is this guy a threat to us? Because, I mean, everything that they have based their lifestyle on is, is power and, and wealth and control. I mean, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they controlled everything, aside from what Rome didn't control. But the truth of the matter is, inside the Jewish faith, inside the Jewish lifestyle, uh, if you were a Pharisee or a Sadducee or part of the Sanhedrin, I mean, you were the ruling class. And now we've got to decide, is this guy going to take away everything that we have? Well, what's he tell them? Your whole lifestyle is about to change. Everything you have known is about to be cut down. That's what he's saying as, as he's preaching to them. Now, turn over, if you will, to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter number 3. As I said, this, this account is in all four of the Gospels. And so as we look at this, we have to kind of compare the two. So after this message, after he's preaching to these Pharisees and he's preaching to the Sadducees, he's baptizing people, he's preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. All of these people that are watching this, they begin to question, is he the Christ? Is he the Messiah? Luke chapter 3, beginning in verse number 9. And here's the, that message again. Now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answereth and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. 
and he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, we sh what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely. Be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not. Do you see that? So as we see this taking place, we see uh, this, this baptism and we see uh, John preaching to the Pharisees. It tells us here that all you know, these people that are, are getting baptized and their lives are being changed and they're all saying, is he the Messiah? Is he the Christ? They're ready to follow him. Do you see this? They're ready to turn. They're ready to change their, their whole lifestyle and follow John. We'll go back to our text in Matthew chapter 3 and we see how John answers this. John has to address the issue and he says in verse 11, Indeed, I baptize you with water unto repentance, uh, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. I shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Or, I did it again. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat under the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So he says, I'm not the one you're looking for. I'm not the Christ. I'm preparing you for his arrival. Because again, he tells them, everything you know is about to change. I'm getting you ready for that. This is the preparation for Jesus. He's saying, I'm preparing you for the one that is to come. And notice he says in verse 12, he says, he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. So what's he saying there? He's giving them a, an image, if you will, of the threshing floor and how they would go out there and they would throw the wheat up into the air and then they would beat the wheat and they would fan it out and the, the chaff, which was worthless, would blow away and what was good would remain. And so he's saying he is going to separate the true believers from the religious charlatans. The one that's coming is about to change your life. Can you imagine this? I mean, if you were a Jew in that region and you had heard this man preaching and seen everything that was taking place, this would have been like, what in the world is going on? You realize that, that we haven't heard anything like this for 400 years because the Jews have been in control, the, the Jewish religious system has been in control, and God has been silent for 400 years. There's been no new prophecy. There's been no new, uh, new uh, visions or anything. And here comes John, and he said, yeah, we're going to turn your world upside down. Everything's about to change. So go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, we see this. And beginning in verse 19, it says here, John chapter 1, verse 19, and this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? He answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not the Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Betharborah, beyond Jordan, 
where John was baptizing. So again, we see them and these, these Pharisees and these Sadducees that come and they begin to question him, are you the Christ? Tell us. We've got to give an answer to those that have sent us. Well, who sent them? Annas and Caiaphas. Caiaphas, the high priest, he's heard about this man, and this man could be a threat to my position, so you guys go question him, and you go find out who this is. Notice they're asking him, are you the Christ? Why are they asking him that? Because they know the prophecies. They know the word of God. They know that one is coming that's going to change everything. They know that their king is coming. Are you him? He said, oh, no, I'm not him. I'm just here to prepare the way. I'm just getting you ready for what is to come. And they couldn't stomach John. Now, think about that. They couldn't handle the way John was preaching. And he says, boy, I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. The one that's coming, whoa, just wait. I mean, can you imagine this? Now, I get excited reading it. I can imagine how excited John was getting. I mean, you can't wait to see what's coming. Just hold on to your hats because this is big, right? I mean, this is, this is what's going on here. And John's just preparing for Jesus to come, and he's preparing the way. He is, he's prophesied to come. Even John is prophesied to come to prepare the way for Christ. And everyone should have known this was going to happen. And when John appeared on the scene, they were all shocked. Who is this crazy man? Who is this wild man coming out of the wilderness? Are you the Christ? No. I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. Something's about to happen, folks. So we see the preparation for Jesus and then back in our text, we also see the persistence of Jesus. <clears throat> we see the persistence of Jesus beginning in Matthew 3 and verse 13. Then, after all this has happened, then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Now notice this. We see here that when Jesus is coming, come, come to John to be baptized, John says, No, Lord, I, I need you to baptize me. I, I don't need to baptize you. What's he saying? I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to baptize you. Now, if you look at everything that's happened up until this point, I mean, John is the man. John is on the scene, and everybody is amazed, and everybody, are you the Messiah? And here comes Jesus, and he says, I'm not even worthy to baptize you. I mean, it reminds me a lot of Peter. In John chapter 13, when Jesus wanted to wash Peter's feet, and he said, no, Lord, you, you don't need to wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you don't belong to me. Because neither one of these men understood what was about to take place. They didn't understand the purpose that Jesus had for them. But Jesus says in verse 15, and notice this, For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. You see, John didn't understand the importance of his role in the Father's plan. And Jesus is persistent in telling John, you have to baptize me because this is the will of God. This is what God wants to take place. This is what God wants to happen. And if you do not do this, then we cannot fulfill the prophecy. Are you catching this? John's part of this. He doesn't realize how much he's a part of this. And the truth of the matter is, when Jesus comes to him, he's in awe and he's just, he's amazed at who Jesus is. But Jesus is persistent because he's going to fulfill God's plan at all costs. John, you have to baptize me. You must. This has to be done now in order for us to fulfill all righteousness. What an amazing picture here. 
And so we see, if you will, look at Matthew chapter 5. We see examples of Jesus' persistence and, and the will of the Father. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Jesus is speaking here. He says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Notice what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, I've come for a purpose. I have come to fulfill the law. And even if heaven and earth passes away, this law still must be fulfilled because this is God's will. And nothing's going to change that. All right, turn over to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. So many times when we, when we look at the life of Jesus, I, I think these are the things that we miss because his, his persistence in, in performing the will of God is a perfect example for us. In Luke 16, beginning in verse 14, it says here, And the Pharisees also, uh, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye... Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. You ought to underline that statement in your Bible. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass than one tittle of the law to fail. Did, did you catch that? I mean, there's so much there. I could probably teach on just those few verses for a week. But, I mean, you think about what he's saying here. The law was important. The law was vital. The law is important until John came. Now that John has come, we're not pushing the law anymore. We're not preaching the law anymore. We're preaching the kingdom of God. You see this? He's saying, but that doesn't nullify the law. He's saying the law is still there. The law has not changed because I have come to fulfill the law. I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. Now, that means that what he's saying here is it's not a matter of the law being non-existent. You see, the entire purpose of the law was to point lost sinners to Christ. The whole purpose of the law was to show us our sin and to teach us that without Christ, we cannot overcome sin. And the law was the way that God spoke to mankind in the Old Testament. And now Jesus is saying, I have come to be a fulfillment of that law. And now he's saying, our communication with God is going to change. Our relationship with God is now different. Because it's no longer about you keeping the law. It's about you being a part of his kingdom. And remember, God has not spoken to Israel for 400 years. And now all of a sudden, God is speaking again in a different way. He's not condemning the law. He's not saying the law is no longer in effect. He's saying the law still points you to me. Because I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, right? So he's saying, I am the fulfillment of that law. You've had the law all of your life, and now here am I in the flesh to fulfill it. Everything in that law has pointed you to me. And he's going to fulfill that law. He's going to fulfill the Father's plan. He was so persistent. He said the word of God must be fulfilled at all cost. Regardless of what happens, I'm here simply to fulfill the word of God. So, so, so this was not just his baptism. Oh, okay, uh, this was not just Jesus being dipped under the water. This was, this was his persistence, and we see it in his, his entire ministry. It was his persistence to become nothing more than everything God wanted him to be. 
That's what it was. He persisted in John baptizing him because he had to fulfill the law that God had set forth. And this was part of prophecy. This was part of his coming. It had to take place. And he said, I'm going to fulfill the law. Now, I wonder sometimes if we are as persistent in our service for him as he was in setting the example for us. Think about that. Do we put forth as much effort in our service for Christ as we do service to our boss? Do, do we put forth as much service to Christ as we do service to our hobbies and pastimes? Do we put forth as much service to Christ as we do uh, as much effort to Christ as we do to getting our children to all their sporting events and all of their activities? I mean, think about that. Christ was persistent. This is the will of God, and this is going to happen regardless. John, we must fulfill all righteousness. It's between you and me. We've got to do this, right? We see the persistence of Jesus is an example to us all. And then finally, back in our text, we see here that we have the pronouncement on Jesus. In verse 16 of Matthew chapter 3, the Bible says, and, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. We see the pronouncement on Jesus. This is, this is an amazing event because this is an amazing start to his ministry. As he's coming up out of the water, now notice this, he went up straightway, so there's no sprinkling here, there's no pouring. He's completely immersed. In fact, uh, the word baptize means to make fully wet. So he's completely immersed in the water. John picks him up, and as he's coming up, he's staring into heaven. And the Bible says that in verse 16 that a, 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 a dove or the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove. Now, it says that he saw this, but I want you to look at, at Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, we see this again. In Luke chapter 3, beginning in verse 21, it says, now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was open and the Holy Ghost descending in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. So did you see that? We have a bodily shape. So this wasn't just some, some private vision that Jesus saw. Everyone who was there would have seen this dove descend from heaven. And what does the Bible say? That this was the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God descending from heaven in the form of a dove. Everyone would have experienced this. Everyone would have seen it. Knowing that this was something special. This was something to take note of. But back in our text, look at verse 17 again. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Not only did they see this dove descend from heaven and descend onto Jesus, they also heard a voice from heaven. This, was, this would have been an audible voice, and God himself spoke from heaven and said of Jesus, This is my beloved Son. He was expressing his pleasure in Jesus' obedience because God loves obedience. Now, as I said, this account is, is written down in all four of the Gospels, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three record this voice. So everyone would have heard this voice. You see, again, this is not an individual vision of Jesus. Everyone around would have experienced this. So, I mean, you think about it, what an amazing proclamation. This is my son. Oh, what an amazing publication. What an amazing pronouncement from God. This is the son of God. 
there should have been no doubt as to who he is. Why did they question him? Why did anyone wonder? Why did anyone have any doubts as to who or why he was there? Why would anyone question Jesus Christ? Because God himself spoke from heaven at his baptism and said, This is my son. This is the son of God. You remember just a few minutes before this, they were asking John, Are you the Messiah? Are are you the one that's come to save us? Are you him? Are you the Savior? And Jesus comes up out of the water. We see the dove. We hear the voice of God. And then we question Jesus. It just doesn't make sense. Of course, we think about who's there. Who's in this crowd? Obviously, just regular people, you know, farmers, shepherds, business people of the, of the area. In fact, in our scripture and in Mark, it says that all the land of Judea went out and, and Jerusalem and all of these people came from everywhere. But it also says that there were publicans there. There were soldiers there. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees were there. Do you remember why the Pharisees and the Sadducees came? Because they were sent by Caiaphas and by Annas. You go find this John and you go find out who he is. You find out if he's the Christ because we need to know. And God proclaims Jesus to be his son and they missed it. How'd they miss it? What an amazing picture. You see... He was a direct threat to their power, to their wealth, to their control. When God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, I believe their hatred grew because they knew that their reign had come to an end. And they couldn't have this Jesus around, and I believe from this point they began to conspire to get rid of him. Remember what I said, this is the start of his earthly ministry. This is where it all began. And we too, as children of God, as followers of Christ, we should be seeking our own pronouncement from him. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Is that not what we're seeking? You see, here's the example. God sees obedience, he blesses obedience. God recognizes obedience. And when we, when we step into heaven, when we are ushered into the presence of Christ, what we want to hear is him pronounce us good and faithful. He set the example. You see, that's what his baptism is all about. Jesus being baptized was not just some some ceremonial thing that he had to go through to please the people watching. This was evidence of God's plan and, and evidence of his obedience to God. And Jesus being baptized by John was an example of how we should live in obedience to him as well. Regardless of what others might think, regardless of what others might say, we should be obedient to everything that God has for us to do. Because we want to have that pronouncement, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Just like God pronounced Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Do you see the example here? This was the whole purpose of Jesus' baptism. For us to recognize if Jesus had to be faithful, we too then must be faithful. He set us an example of how to live. So this pronouncement by God began his earthly ministry, leaving many to say, well, I can't wait to see what happens next. While leaving others to say, we've got to figure out how to stop this guy. Which side are we on? I mean, you know, I, I was saved in, in, in 1991, and, and it's almost like every day it's, oh, I can't wait to see what happens next. Some days are like, oh, I can't wait to see what happens next. You know, <laughs> but as you're living for Christ and, and you're serving God, it's amazing how God opens doors, how God provides, and how, how God takes care of every single need. It's just amazing, and, and the example of that started right here with the baptism of Jesus. 
We see the preparation for Jesus. John being that forerunner. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, right? We see the persistence of Jesus. He was going to fulfill God's plan regardless of what happened. He, if he'd have had no followers, he still would have fulfilled God's plan. And we see the pronouncement on Jesus. This is the Son of God. There's no doubt. There should have been no doubt in those days. But, but we have the complete word of God here in, in what he's saved for us. So there should be no doubt in our minds either who Jesus is and what he means to us. Amen. Father, we thank you today for this time. We thank you for this, this lesson that we can see through the baptism of Jesus. Help us, Lord, each to learn the faithfulness of Christ and to learn the obedience of Christ and to express those same qualities in our life as we serve you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all that you do for us, though we're undeserving. We do pray, God, that you'd be with our pastor as he comes to preach this morning. Fill him with your power and your boldness and give us the message that we need for our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.